Okay, sound check, film check is completed. Uh, I welcome back our wonderful audience. And so far things have, I think, moved quite all right. And um, we didn't even have major problems, just small problems. And um, we have uh, four more uh, participants before the dinner break. And I'm very happy now to introduce Fun Mi Adevole. Uh, from uh, Leicester and uh, Thomas Kampe, who is stationed in Bar. And uh, they both will slightly shift the subject, but not too much. And I'm going to share screen now and then let um, Funmi sit down at my laptop. Strong. Strong, okay. Okay, good afternoon and um, I'm very happy to be here. So um, my talk is going to be about um, choreography, Africanist, Africanist aesthetics and artistic citizenship. Um, and I'm responding to a theme about the repairing of the public um, space. So how does performance prepare, um, repair um, the public space? I'm just checking something. So I'm gonna whiz through this because I've got 10 minutes and it's a provocation, but I went a bit mad and put a lot in, <laughs> too much into it. So first of all, what's African dance aesthetics? And it's a, it's a conceptual framework, really, looking at the different kinds of features and aesthetics that you see across a wide range of dances um, that you find in Africa and in the diaspora. So everywhere in the world, really, that where you find dances that have some African influences. So you can find African aesthetics, obviously, in dances from Africa, but also, uh, Cuban dances, dances from Puerto Rico, uh, salsa, uh, lots of dances have African aesthetics, Caribbean dances. And if you look at my list, it has things like the use of the flat foot, the soft knee, ice, body isolations, qualities of vibrations, flow, swing, low center of gravity. And what I, I'm talking about today is um, what's the power of African dance aesthetics in the public space? Um, and um, what kind of critical discourse do, uh, do, do we need for this? And it's because when I started out as a researcher, and I'm talking about 20, 20 years ago, because I'm an independent researcher before I became an, an academic, um, most of the, the discussion was about authenticity. Is this authentic or not when it, you know, when you saw such dances on stage? Things have moved on now and uh, lots of theorists are talking about other things when they see dances with African influences or African dances on stage. For example, Olu, who, who is here today, has written about the return beat in, in Yoruba dance, for example. So it's not stuck there, but um, it, it um, it's still something that I feel hasn't been addressed enough. So I'm really thinking about the politics of recontextualization. When, when a dance, which is a so, originally a social dance, goes on stage or forms part of a choreographic vocabulary, those movements are sort of recontextualized. And I think that a discourse that engages with what that means um, will supply us with a lot of information and ideas um, which are useful for the public space the public sphere. Theatre is very powerful as an uh, stage da um, dance on stage is actually quite powerful in the sense that it's the it's it's where people uh, 
review work, it's the work that gets talked about, it's studied in curriculum, it's the work that where choreographers can comment on a lot of political situations, they can bring in aesthetics and make visible uh, uh, views of the world which are not normally seen and they can engage with uh, politics and philosophy so uh, the theater theatrical dance or presentations of that kind are really very powerful in the public sphere and uh, um, so I'm going to look at two examples one from popular popular culture and this this national dance movement which took off in Africa in the 50s where a number of African countries launched companies uh, at the eve of independence to, um, to, to project their new identity as new nations. Now, these, I grew up with some of these companies. I remember in, in primary school, when I was in primary school in Nigeria, you know, watching a uh, cultural dance on television and what it did is that Nigeria is a group as a country with about 280 eth ethnic uh, groups uh, three major groups about 280 and a national company would bring dances from all those regions together now in Europe you call that folk dance in in Nigeria it was extremely modern because how would I ever get in contact with a Hausa dance as a Yoruba girl, and less through the theater. So it was only in the theater you could, you could engage, or only with the staging of dance could you in, could engage with dances from different parts and create a completely different a sense of what it was to be a Nigerian. So it was a, um, it was a great impact with the public space. They also created lots of discussions across disciplines. Um, when Kiete Fodeba um, started Le Bale Africaine in the 1950s, um, it, it, called it, up, it caused uproar in certain places. He actually started the company in the 40s, and it was called Le Bale Africaine de Kiete Fodeba, in nightclubs in France. It didn't cause trouble there, but once he put it on the stage, which was the place for ballet or artistic dance, people were saying, was this the right place for traditional African dances, it dis degraded them, it, um, it bastardized them. And he argued that what he was doing is that he was, um, he, uh, this is a quote of his, he said, African dance, he said, if ballet is a form of artistic expression um, developed by man in his quest for a new means of expression, African dance is doing the same. So he actually wanted to start a debate and he succeeded around the idea of African civilization. So you can find writings by Sede Senghor, who was the president of Senegal at the time, Franz um, um, Fanon, who was a philosopher, also spoke about Kida Futaba. So at that time, it was actually very radical. Now, um, such dance performances are sometimes considered part of popular culture, even world music, for example. But at the time, it was, it was a quite a radical thing. And so I see what those companies were doing in the realm of um, artistic citizenship. And I think if we look at what um, com companies that were staging traditional dances were doing as artistic citizenship, you can see that they were um, creating discussions and challenging discourses in, in various ways. And this is one um, quote about what artistic citizenship is that I like. It says, artists engaged in praxis are deeply committed to making art that reflects their own critical perspectives on their places and spaces. Their practices are gu guided by the important ethical question, what kind of artists is it good to be given, is, sorry, what kind of artist is it good to be given my current set of circumstances? So now I want to move on to something much more recent. And if anyone knows, this is Master KG and the dancer, I don't want to pronounce her name because I'm sure it's going to pronounce it wrong, but she's got an amazing voice. And during uh, COVID, um, he, 
released a song called Jerusalem. And this, this um, song, he, he, he um, featured this singer, Unkomba, if I'm um, non, non Seba, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. She's got an amazing voice. And um, they created this song. And then a group of Angolian dan Ang Angolan dancers, so, so from Angola, they created a dance. So the dance they created took steps from Kuduru, some street dances, Pansula, and they created a dance. And the challenge was to do the dance whilst eating. So if you see them, um, they're here and they do the dance. If you see the video, they do the dance whilst eating. And this um, became a challenge and it took off and went around the world. So we have here firemen in Switzerland, um, no, policemen in Switzerland doing the dance. We have monks and nuns in Italy doing the Jerusalem challenge. We have people at the airport, and I think this is in Portugal, doing the Jerusalem challenge. And there's all sorts. If you go online, tons of people dancing this same song. And the one I think that was the most popular was this group of young children from an orphanage in Uganda. The, they call them the Masaka kids. Um, somebody filmed them dancing it and that also um, you know, went around the world. And if you go online and you look at uh, all the discussions, the kind of articles, the, the, um, the comments in chats around this dance, um, they hit on so many um, topics like the choreo, that is the colloquial word for the choreography, what dances um, were included, the music. So um, Master KG is from the Limpopo um, house music, Theology, because the song has a is gospel inflected, so the 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 idea of Jerusalem is my home, and a lot of hope expressed in the song. Issues of copyright, because Warner Brothers, um, who signed Master KG, started saying they wanted um, certain people should start paying uh, for using the, the music in a challenge. And then there was debates about Afro-Atlantic expressiveness, which is um, a whole discussion around how dances in Africa and in um, produce joy, even under extremely difficult circumstances. And so much discussion about the hope and togetherness this um, dance created in the face of COVID-19. So I would like to show a link, uh, a, a one minute of the, the um, challenge. But before I do that, I just want to do a quick, um, a quick quote about the public space. Um, and this is from David Harvey. And he's talking about, um, it's difficult to say what's the relationship between the public space, like the squares in a city, uh, of the parks, and the public sphere. What are the color coloration between these two things? But he's saying it's um, that it's impossible. He says, surely. Um, he goes the he goes surely walking through the city in the public spaces that you inhabit surely looking around and being influenced and feeling your environment, you will start to think and act politically. And so I'm just arguing here that dances that cross borders, cross borders of race, ethnicity, go from social places, places of ritual to the theater, to, to the stage, go online, they, in, they, that the politics of re, uh, of this continual recontextualization creates these kind of discourses, which I think more attention needs to be paid to. So if we can just uh, play um, a mini clip um, of one of somebody did a compilation of the ten best, but there are several compilations of the ten best <laughs> Jerusalem challenges, but this is one of them. Yeah. 
Jerusalem i kayala mi kilo no lo sé Jerusalem i kayala mi kilo no lo sé Thomas to come in and we'll do the brief feedback in a moment. So uh, we're going to continue right away. And uh, Funmi, uh, this is uh, opening our circle. Thank you. And um, the messiness of it all, uh, the triple consciousness, yeah. <laughs> the, what were you worried about? The pronunciation of Jerusalem? Of no, oh, the dancer, the <laughs> dancer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Because I know that your high taught me that uh, Jerusalem is, is pronounced Jerusalem. Yeah? <laughs> all right, so uh, I'm going to bring up Tom's PowerPoint one second. That's lovely. And then we move on. <coughs> oh my God. Um, can everyone see and hear me? Um, I hope that's all okay. Um, my name is Thomas Camper. I'm a professor for somatic performance and education at Bath Spa University, which, which I gave myself that title. That's just really exciting um, because I thought, because a couple of years ago, um, we were supposed to, somatics was more or less illegal at our university because it's not scientifically really sound and it's just a lot of hocus pocus, as our dean said, and then once the dean retired, um, we moved on a little bit. So I'm going to talk about a project which I did um, with my brother, with my brother, who's also a retired professor now um, in design, I'll talk a little bit about him. Um, called Beyond Forgetting Persecution, Exile, Memory, um, Transdisciplinarity in Design, Performance and Education. I have worked, oops, and I need to see how we're going to do this presentation now. I don't know how to move on at the moment. Sorry, I do know how to move on. Sorry, here we are. I think we've moved on. So this is uh, briefly, I'll, I'll talk about an uh, uh, this project, which was an educational project also a series of symposia as an educational project with students in Germany and in the UK and a book we've just published as an open access book as an educational resource. Things we've worked on between 2017 and 2021. Um, I need to just check again how I do how I go to the next step. Um, so really this was an attempt to to activate critical practice and critical pedagogy, particularly in the field of design. 
and design pedagogies. My brother was a professor for experimental design in the field of product design. Everything is about product, very little about process. And But there are new fields emerging in design, so-called social design, where we understand design as a socially transformative process. I've also been interested in working with history and heritage studies and looking at um, my own research has been about 20th century dance research, exile dance research, Jewish dance exile research, really. Uh, and we were working with inviting embodiment and performing arts modalities into the fields, into traditionally disembodied fields, design and um, heritage studies. And we looked at also how can we create a pedagogy that deals with contemporary, that accesses contemporary socially relevant themes. Here we chose exile, migration, and so uh, exile and migration. We also were concerned with the continuous, continuing anti democratic developments all over Europe and how can we develop pedagogies that engage with critical and democratic citizenship. So a little background about the Camper brothers. Well, we're both really first general, second generation perpetrators, German perpetrators, I found out recently. That's a kind of label I could give myself here. My brother on the left, me that little one here from humble backgrounds in the 1960s in, the, in, in Germany with our family who were pretty poor and simple people. Um, somehow tried to make sense of the changes in society in after the second world war i come from an extremely beautiful place in the middle of germany called kassel really a beautiful nature reserve there and and it's a beautiful town but it also has a pretty horrendous history of being right in the middle of germany and um being a, a center for industrial uh, a, sorry a center for war industry and one of the cities that were destroyed in germany during the war 80 percent of being destroyed so our, 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 our childhood was really, really shaped by uh, th this, this strangeness of the trauma of the Second World War and the, and the Holocaust. But from a German, young German, um, from a young German perspective, really, and male perspective, it was very difficult to make sense for us of our childhood and of our cultural context. But we were certainly shaped by what Theodor Adorno called an education after Auschwitz, an, Au an education that was um, towards awareness and education towards criticality and education towards empathy. And of course, Kassel was the center of documenta and still is the center of where every five years the leading um, European avant-garde exhibition was hosted since 1955, really where we were introduced as young people already um, towards art that, uh, to quote Herbert Marcuse, that explores fundamentally different existentials, existential relations as part of a great refusal against a counterforce against aggressive and exploitative socialization that really formed our the whiteness we were coming from. Here's a little chapter in our book, the introduction, my brother and myself, we talk really very much about our the confusion of our childhood that shaped us. I won't read this now, it's too long to read. Another thing that really shaped both of my brother and myself was a, a deep friendship with a, with a Holocaust survivor choreographer, Austrian choreographer living in London, Hilda Holger, where we had first-hand experience of artistic practice of a survivor of the Shoah and working hands-on with her. And, and working with her, there's me as a young dancer here, working with Hilda also meant caring for Hilda, who was severely disabled. She choreographed and taught and she was 96. So I had 13 years of sharing her stories and realizing the, the power of dance for her as a survivor. I also worked for 30 years with the Jewish theater companies looking Pascal Theatre Company in London, really looking at work that embraces issues of cultural diversity, hidden histories, and reluctant heritage in a British and European context. Um, a strong experience for me was in 19, between 1990 and 2003 to collaborate with a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, Ruth Posner, being her partner on stage and performing all over Europe a play about um, resistance and collaboration of British. 
particularly British collaboration with the Nazis on the government on the islands of Guernsey, on the Channel Islands. Here, me playing her young son in 1990 and Ruth there in the back. I also played all the Nazis beating her, arresting her. So really having to come to terms with rehearsing in synagogues in a Nazi uniform as a young German. Painful, traumatic, but a deeply healing process for myself. I also choreographed and performed and, and co-directed a project called the Dibuk, a kind of Holocaust staged version of Ansky's Dibuk, famous choreography. I've in the later on had many other connections to the to the choreography of the Dibuk through research I did in Israel. Um, one of the latest projects I did with Pascal Theatre Company was a, a site-specific project directing it with, with 50 performers and 800 audiences in um, Trent Park, doing a guided tour, taking children of Holocaust survivors through a, a, a guided tour through a place called Trent Park, where for 800 or 1,500 German officers and officers and um, generals were interned and they were bugged for seven years there and we told the stories of these people as an intergenerational experience where young people were telling stories about the second world war to survivors of the Shoah or also children of the survivors of the Shoah. So this is kind of part of the background. My brother was all often involved in these projects and we created this educational project beyond forgetting uh, connecting to the Kristallnacht, to the to the first escalation of the Shoah in Europe, uh, 80 years after that, and looking at historical migration, historical exile, and contemporary exile in Germany by seeing how performing arts technologies and strategies and sensibilities can um, be be informing design processes and taking also other experts outside other witnesses people from outside the field into this educational process here's some pictures of us taking ma dance students into workshops with with um design students working through touch and creating empathy and a very um empath em empathic and evocative and emotional situations embodied situations really re-embodying design processes also working on workshops on memorial culture, how we, with this year with our, uh, artist Stefan von Borstel, or work, workshops with people who'd worked with contemporary exile and migration. Here, storytelling from a Syrian um, refugee, Mohammed, who talks about his story of um, traveling from Syria to Germany illegally. This ended up in a symposium in Bath, and it ended up, it started with a symposium actually in Bath, and ended up with a symposium in Coburg with a wonderful group of people from Israel, from Iran, from Morocco, from the UK, from the US. Here's a project that students did when we started to introduce socially pertinent topics and um, topics of embodiment, process of embodiment, where these students stopped producing products, but they started to facilitate processes and installations to to enable people to to access non spaces hidden spaces abject spaces um, here's another project where students were using uh, inquiring as part of their design projects the use of language the race racism embedded in everyday the everyday races embedded in language in the media we invited also 20 students from the University of Applied Sciences in Berlin into this process, looking at questioning the examination of remembrance from a perspective of 2018. Here's some students who used embodiment processes in relationship to questioning their own feelings and sensations. Or here, a Korean student who worked on um, the grief around pleasure women, forced prostitution in the Asian um, Pacific War. We then published the book out of all this. The book is structured in four, um, in four chapters, more or less, designed within a social societal context, embodying memory, hidden histories, hidden histories, objects, media, and trauma, and the last one, dialogue and interaction to go back into embodiment. We invited about 15 international scholars and the students into writing about new roles of design, 
hear a colleague from Bath talking about forced war, reenacting forced Nazi death marches in Germany and in the UK as participatory art practice practices. Um, Stefan von Borstel talked about his work of re reworking at the Brighton now concentration camp memorial site where he looked at embodiment and empathy and the use of objects and color with a reference of Josef Bo to Josef Beuys. I talked about my research on um, the work of Gertrud Bodenwieser and, and her dancers, Gertrud Bodenwieser, the first professor in choreography in Austria who was um, left Austria in 1938. She was the teacher of my teacher, Hilde Holger, and she went into exile as a persecuted Jewish choreographer. And we look particular in this project, in this essay, I'm, talk, I'm looking at notions of crypto Judaism, a really kind of miming, a miming of Christianity within the dance practice where dancers dance kind of Christian themes with hair dyed blonde in Australia to desperately disguise their Semitic features and their Jewish heritage in, 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 their, in their choreographic practice. Um, in, the, in the wonderful um, chapter on objects media trauma, we had Sophie Dixon from um, Brighton talking about, working about hidden histories here, looking at virtual and mixed reality um, in, in addressing issues around displacement of the Sudeten Deutschen, the German kind of not displaced Nazi, partially Nazi Germans after the Second World War and revisiting um, lost villages there. Iranian artist, um, nearly done, Iranian artist, um, Baha Majdaze talked about the politics of space and the, the in inheritance of memory through cartography strategies that allows the artist to examine historical events and reinvent spaces which are lost um, under the totalitarian regime in Iran. Um, we've had a Moroccan writer um, Brahim Benmo talking about trauma, trauma theory in relationship to American 9-11 novels. And finally, we in the last chapter, we worked with a collective called of students called Feel Effect, who talked about a year-long residency in different well, um, in different camps in Serbia, Greece, and Macedonia, and kind of presenting um, creative work also reflections on embodied and creative processes within the camps. I talked about, I wrote an essay about a project called Punti di Fuga, which was about enacting empathy with, in a workshop with um, people with refuge, Syrian and Iraqi and Lebanese refugees in a refugee camp in East Germany, where we did embodiment workshops. Steve Tiller, Jewish, the, Jewish choreographer, theatre director Steve Tiller talked about his own cultural heritage and working with refugee choirs on staging um, a, a wonderful opera called The, the, the Consul in, uh, by Menotti in London and also talks about um, the situation in Gaza today. And finally, we worked with um, uh, we have writings by a wonderful filmmaker, Yehuda Sharim, a Jewish um, Iranian filmmaker living in the US, working with um, um, refugees in the US. And we watched the, his film and I thought this is one of the most boring films I've ever seen. And after 20 minutes of watching and getting kind of sucked into the film, we all sat there in tears being gradually drawn into, into, into empathy with the stories of the children, of the people, of, of, of the people involved in his filmmaking, very powerful work. So really kind of the, the, the project questions, you know, how do we embrace history from a kind of critical whiteness point of view, perhaps we as, as white Europeans of a certain generation, how do we embrace history critically in the period when statues are falling, when we have to question our own position um, and how do we construct 
um, pedagogies in traditionally neoliberal consumer-oriented fields such as product design, which are critical. And, 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 and my brother ended up saying he wants to do a PhD now on um, design verhinderung, um, on the resistance of design. Okay, I'll finish here. Thank you very much. And I can put the link into the free ebook also. I can add that we've done a free ebook, so it's all freely available as an educational resource. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Funmi. Whew. This was, of course, uh, a lot, Thomas. We have to maybe yeah. breathe for a moment. And this is why I, I wonder on such an, you know, complex workshop how how do we connect all the different uh, presentations and and yet have a dialogue so let me then just for breathing space invite the audience to ask questions we'll have a little bit of time and then we will have to move on to our last two presenters are there responses i see a wow Thomas Campbell, what brave work. And I think you are raising the issue of history and memory and growing up after the war. I mean, it's such a, in a way, different context to what Funmi was evoking. But Funmi, your, your perspective is global. It's pan-cultural. Um, and yeah, and, and I appreciate your positive optimistic approach because you know there is at the moment of our uh, crisis in, in, in this world in, in terms of Black Lives Matter and the fight for justice, uh, not so many people are optimistic, so thank you. And Thomas, uh, recalling the past is always important. Uh, Ram, you have a question. Do you want to come here? No, no, no. Just, uh... They need to hear you. I just to understand uh, uh, your choice of uh, bringing those two uh, beautiful and interesting people oh. together. To, uh, okay, to the choice of bringing them together. Um, the, the workshop, as the invited guests of today know, was primarily a response to my interest, my, my, my offer to become more interested in inclusivity and uh, as body artists, you know, working with people from every way of life, the, the messy world of people with different knowledge, different um, abilities. In my fear that the pandemic would create more isolation, more insulation and more disablement, I thought maybe next year 2021 we can already look at a time of inter-pandemic or slightly moving further yeah but uh is there a social space now where we can touch and hug each other and kiss each other yeah dance together yeah or is this going to be regulated and forbidden or restricted so the the question of cultural space and public space was a part of the notion of thinking about new rituals, old rituals. Olu has a question. Olu, please, Olu, please speak. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, the, the last um, series of um, workshops and, and uh, discussions are extraordinary, extraordinary pieces of, um, of, of, of juxtaposition. So I congratulate you to all in, in, in including that. Uh, the points that Fumi was making was touched me quite deeply. I think she's got, and again, because I was born, I'm a Yoruba person born in London, and she'd probably understand that as Ajibwata, you know, someone who, <laughs> and she's born in Nigeria. So her perspective of how transcultural dance was in relation to uh, the, the, the post-colonial, as countries were beginning to assert their identity, usually drawn out by European powers. So there was a kind of, 
was um, uh, fantastic. Uh, and and your last, I didn't quite didn't quite get the last person's name. The last uh, Thomas. Yeah, fantastic, fabulous. I want to say uh, the, the 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 it's more of a comment really. The thing um, <clears throat> I wonder he might be familiar with this term meta design. It's a group of people who are looking at because I'm one of those meta designers uh, who are looking at redesigning designing. So so, so this is a a very very important. Uh, process movement Re not just it's not, it's not it's not actually redesigning design it's redesigning designing the nature of designing particularly as we come out of this pandemic um i just thought of it extraordinary to get uh, a descendant of a german culture to so critically examine the processes that one must have gone to now i i felt a huge amount of empathy towards him for that I was really touched by it. And um, I think that the ways in which we can um, exchange human experience is so, so, so valuable. So it's more of, there's no really question there. It's more kind of an appreciation and uh, and maybe just, just offer some suggestions there. And, and Thomas, if you will fully yeah, want fantastic. to have dialogue, please. I mean, I, I see, um, I see a lot of connections between what, I mean, I know Fumi very well, we know each other very well, and I know, you know, I know quite a lot of people here, you know, and I've been, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner, and I'm working with movement and, and, and embodiment and somatics, and at some point I thought, you know, Feldenkrais is all about identity, the work is all about you coming to I your identity, and I embody, through embodiment, but there's also a cultural identity. And I am who, where I'm coming from. Like Fumi is where she's coming from. We all are where we're coming from, and we all are. We all are, are now as well. But you know, and and I spent 20 years of my life, or 27 years of my life, struggling to embrace my cultural heritage, mm. and that really made me depressed, mm. sick. I couldn't embrace my masculinity, my power. I was disguising myself. I don't know. I was, you know, and 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 actually embracing embracing this Nazi heritage the, in a very fortunate uh, through embodied encounters with people from the other side who were victims, but but who understood my perspective. And we spent twenty years as a kind of meta in a meta dialogue, you know, working as second generation Jewish German people together with that. And in the same way I spent many years with my brother. Why are we the way we are? And can we do something with this from mm. the heart? But also with our intelligence and and you know, and who do I want to be as a pedagogue? How do I want to be in the classroom every day? And this was the project like this is for me, um, it's an affirmation. It's an affirmation for me. I do need to embrace my cultural heritage. Mm. I do need to embrace that. In, I do need to embrace my ancestors. Do I like them or not? No, yeah. no. Well, I, I for myself, I I, I feel. I feel, I feel, I feel, yeah, yeah, I'm sure, but I do need to somehow, you know, for me, embracing that has been hugely empowering, and I see that, you know, that that's when 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 Fumi's talking, Fumi's talking about, okay. yeah, it's, it's not, it's not, that's not a question. I absolutely, I don't know whether I want to go back to Germany, but I have embraced something inside. I have embraced a vital. The Nazism was a huge vitality, a demonic vitality, and it and and it was a body culture. It was first and foremost a culture of embodiment and a culture of disembodiment. Uh, and I have managed to arrive in my own embodiment again through these creative processes. Uh, and I saw this with Hilde Holger as a 95-year-old, 96-year-old teacher who would sit there in her wheelchair and beat the drum and say, I must dance, we must dance. Uh, and, and that was her survival, and it was great. It's extraordinary, it's really extraordinary. Thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you olu for your um, encouraging words i was actually born in britain oh, but, okay. 
but I grew up in Nigeria because my parents went back to Nigeria when I was about eight years old. Mm. And so I do, I do um, understand when you say Omajabata, that Omajabata <laughs> thing where yeah. they will say, if you're born in Britain, you're the child that eats butter. And if you're born in Nigeria, you're the child that eats pepper. Oh. Yeah, yeah omolata, omaj- so I do understand that. And I suppose in a way, um, this research is coming out of, because the way I could access culture when I went to Nigeria was through the arts. Mm. And it was through, it wasn't, you know, it was through the organization of arts within primary school and secondary school and university. Although as I grew up, I went back to the village and I experienced certain things, but it was mainly through these systems which were called modern. And, I, and, and we leave that out of our story as Africans. We leave out what we did within the institutions that we use the arts to adopt and adapt Western institutions into our culture. Yes, so yes. the whole university system, how did we Africanize it? How did we Africanize secondary schools? How do we take systems that were once used to organize us as a colonial nature, nation? How do we try and use it in a democratic sense? Mm. And for a number of years, it was going well. And then we started having military dictatorships and another set of things came in. And I'm wondering if that project had continued Mm. And if you, if in my research, I've read journals from the 1950s up to the 1970s, the kind of thinking that was in Afri- happening in Africa and how dancing was used to create this pan-African sensibility and how people were using dance to transcend ethnicity, <clears throat> transcend, you know, you had situations where, which, are, which is very difficult now in Nigeria today, where an Igbo man, um, a Hausa man would be a mayor in an, like, hold the position of a mayor in an Igbo town and Igbo people were happy with that. Right now, everybody has polarized back to, I'm an Igbo, you're a Yoruba, you're a Hausa, yeah. where, where dance was being used to transcend that. Where do we hear these stories? Yeah. We don't hear those stories, do you see what I mean? And now people see those dance companies and think all they are is entertainment. And well, you know what I mean? there was a lot of thinking behind it. And that is the discourse which I feel has not been documented. And the creativity that happened in those, in those um, the choreographic ideas that were developing there have not been documented. And I feel that people like us who live in Europe and all that, the access we have to our culture in a way has been cut off in a way because of that project didn't reach its um potent its full potential do you know can i just I quickly respond to that so sorry i don't want to hog the thing but i just just so many things are so powerful um there, there is a it's uh, this is this is in my book actually um that's just been published um <clears throat> it's um which is about the return beat and uh the kind of notion of the interfacing with our interface the idea of how do we interface with the world um, but it's it's looking at the spirituality through the golden triangle. The golden triangle I'm looking at here is a kind of, if we were to try and find an equivalent of a philosophy of understanding the nature of the world. So you could argue there is a kind of, in the Greco-Roman Judeo-Christian world, it's about the written word. And then, so we, we, we find ways in which we understand the world through what is written. Uh, and of course, we have ways in which you uh, approach interpretation and uh, contextual analysis and all those kind of things. But essentially, the word, if you write something, then it somehow exists. Uh, if you look in the East, the equivalent would be meditation. So there is writing, but of course, meditation and actually approaching the non-word, the non-thought to ex- access the nature of reality. My my Trying to find an equivalent in sub-Saharan Africa, I call it the golden triangle, which is dance <clears throat> or movement with one 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 aspect of it: dance, movement, percussion, rhythm, song, verse or song poetry, or the word, so the spoken word. So those three 
is a way in which we come to understand and know the world. And <clears throat> it seems to me what you're just saying there, which I think is fascinating, is that there was a there is a natural there was a natural movement towards adopting that in a way in which Africa was Africanizing these systems. But that that but we've lost in a sense we've lost that sense of what is the African philosophy and how do we take the African philosophy into the twenty first century. It seems to me you're you're producing some really interesting observations for that. So you know, fantastic stuff. Thank really brilliant. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I was just going to say, we need this, Olu, the Africanization of uh, German culture too. And uh, uh, I'm sure Thomas will be on, on our side. Uh, the, this topic of cultural heritage, may I now call on Maritza and um, Maria. Maritza Dima, a colleague of mine in games, and uh, Maria Castrinou, colleague of mine in anthropology. Are you uh, online there? Okay. And uh, we have about mm, ah, 45, 50 minutes and then we do break for dinner and conversation can continue over dinner here in the, in the outdoors. But Maritza, you are tuning in from Barcelona, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Talk about your engagement with cultural heritage. Yes, so I'm just gonna share my screen because I've got some pictures. Um, and a video to show. Um, so uh, I am uh, coming from a uh, games design background, but also, but mainly the interaction design. Uh, I'm trying to find, sorry, the full screen. Nope. Oh. Um, so and and my my contribution to today's symposium is along the lines of uh, as have been mentioned before about embodiment and embodied cognition uh, and as a designer uh, these are the goals that I strive for whenever I create uh, immersive experiences so I'm I have been researching virtual and augmented reality and mixed reality for for, uh, for more than a decade now uh, and the the um, I'm going to present a project that I did, but through that, I want to show you a little bit of my design perspective and also discuss a little bit about how these kind of technologies can work uh, and with the provocation in, in a societal context. So I, uh, I, I love going around heritage sites uh, because I think that they are immersive spaces themselves, even without any kind of technology. Uh, it's about the, the multi-sensory, uh, uh, experience of being in these spaces, built environment, the smells and the sounds and everything. And, and I know that the heritage industry has tried to augment this in order to you know, uh, tell the history of a space with different uh, different kinds of uh, means, like audio guides or games or performances in space, uh, and even more traditional stuff like labels and uh, and booklets. Uh, but I'm, I'm very much interested in when I transverse the spaces as a visitor on how I can actually e e experience the history, how I can, how I can bring this, this history to life. Uh, and all of these means to learn and, and understand was like, I, I think that they're great, but uh, there's more opportunities from that the digital technology gives to create a more visceral um, experiences. And I'll try to avoid the word immersive because it has a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of weight uh, uh, and research behind it. Uh, so originally, and I have done a few projects like that as well in the beginning. It was augmented reality, and which can very widely now be of course uh, used in many sites and uh, mostly you're using it through your mobile phone or through tablets uh, and you can you can find uh, a lot of apps like museums using uh, apps with that but what i was not really uh, happy with with this is that uh, there's a bit of like a, a, a digital barrier between you and the space so you're going to a historic site in order to experience the history there in through all this kind of multi-sensory way and then suddenly you bring up a mobile phone or a tablet and uh, and this immediately uh, makes you experience the site through a screen basically uh, 
so all of this kind of augmented reality interactions to these devices were not, um, I think, what created a kind of a disembodiment uh, of you being in, in the site. Uh, so I was always on the look of how I can make this more uh, interesting uh, and how I can use um, these kind of technologies uh, in order to design uh, in a way that creates uh, a meaningful interaction. I use the word meaningful in my work a lot uh, because I think uh, when you create something that makes sense to people and they can use it intuitively, another buzzword, um, then, then you can succeed in whatever this goal is education or awareness or, or, or anything else. Uh, there have been some projects which have been really interesting using uh, uh, tablet or mobile uh, augmented reality. Uh, but in 2016, back when I was like finishing up a few projects, this device came out, the mixed reality HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens uh, glasses. Uh, and uh, what I found interesting in this device is that because it's a pair of glasses and especially the second model is super light and, and extremely, with extremely better optics, it allows for like uh, to experience basically superimposed content through the glasses. Uh, and what I found very interesting was that the fact that it was a first person view, whole body interaction, you could use other sensors like your eyes, uh, eyes and gaze tracking and finger tracking or hand tracking. Uh, and you could just like connect physical objects with the glasses. So you could even have objects in space that when you move them, something happens. Uh, and it allows in general, this kind of, not completely, but this digital barrier of holding an iPad in front of you. To me, kind of, it was a little bit uh, eliminated. So I took these glasses and I created a, uh, a project in uh, a two-door house in Hackney called Sutton House. Uh, and actually, I worked uh, with uh, Sophie Dixon, which was mentioned before, and Mimo Singh uh, for that. Uh, and my, uh, the, the, the focus of, of this project that I did uh, was not only on, on seeing how these devices work uh, in general in terms of your embodiment in space and how you understand history, but also whatever is designed to be experienced with these devices, how it can create meaning. And it creates meaning both in the sense that it is a meaningful interaction for people who put on the glasses and walk through the space, but it also helps them understand the history and make meaning of it, because that's one of the, of the main goals of heritage education to learn about the place, not in a kind of, these were the dates that this king was there, blah, blah, blah but also to, to, um, uh, to feel the, what was happening back then, uh, which is something that's not very easily um, like conveyed to, to the visitors. Uh, so thinking about how the, the design, uh, how the approach the design, uh, I uh, went into like storytelling. Uh, because that's by telling, like we, we learn a lot by listening to stories and by telling stories. I think we're, we're like native, um, no, sorry, natural um, uh, storytellers. Uh, and what I strive for, for this um, experience was not only to use this whole body interaction inside the heritage site, but also to, to guide it through storytelling and not just plain stating facts. Um, this was a, um, yeah, so uh, starting the, it was a, just to say, for example, uh, to start with, it was a co-design co approach. So we worked with historians, the educators, uh, public historians of the space. Uh, this is a National Trust property. It was in collaboration with the National Trust in the UK uh, and also with the developers uh, and, and myself being the facilitator um, slash um, coordinator of the process. And the reason that they involved everyone is because everyone has to, um, to be involved in this process from the beginning. The heritage staff needs to learn how these, well, what do these devices do? How do they feel when you put them on? What do you see? Um, and the developers uh, needed to tell us about the challenges and what ideas would be possible and whatnot, but also to kind of like fuse a little bit this knowledge between ourselves, like there was a bit of knowledge exchange in the process. Uh, and the way that we started was uh, very much from the body and from the cell. So who, the first question was, um, uh, and 
who, are, who am I, uh, who I'm wearing the HoloLens, being a visitor? Who am I in this space? Okay, and then how do this experience continue? Where am I coming from? Am I alone? What do I know about this place? Um, and why am I here? So where, what is my goal? What do I do next? Where do I go next? So these were questions that I, I started putting on a paper one day, uh, just starting thinking about how your whole sense of an experience of self changes from the moment you are wearing these glasses, whether you're in a heritage site or, or not. Uh, and I continued with them. Um, and then uh, what I realized was that these uh, questions were explorations that actors do. And this led me into reading a lot about theater and performance uh, and, and finding connections between how I can design this experience uh, or what I can bring as methods in this co-design approach to the others uh, in order to help us create ideas about uh, who the visitor would be, what type of stories they will hear, how are they going to experience the stories. Um, so we created, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go very much into the details of what we created, because I think that's not like probably the point of this presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions later. Um, we created uh, three different stories uh, of three different people who lived in this house in three different eras, because that was a 400 years old house. And we did it in reverse chronological order, starting from the World War II, a story of a soldier uh, going to uh, the, I think it was the Edwardian times, uh, when the house was uh, a finishing uh, school for girls. Uh, and uh, we would uh, have had the uh, had, uh, mistress uh, talking to us. Uh, and finally, uh, the the house was built by Sir Ralph Sadlier, who was the Secretary of State for King Henry VIII, and that was the guy that you see there uh, sitting and writing letters on top left, sorry, top right. Uh, that was the final, the final character. That was the only character also that was actually there as a, as a model. The rest were narrators, as you would hear from, uh, from the headphones that are uh, embedded in, the, in these glasses. So there was a very interesting uh, user evaluation. Uh, all of, of, of the users, uh, the, the people who came to experience the, this uh, said that the, the place came, up, came back to life. Uh, and uh, what was also surprising was I used a method that was called, that's called personal meaning mapping, uh, which has been used in heritage in the past. And what you do there is that you give people uh, a, a paper, a card with a specific um, uh, keyword, which could be anything. For me, it was Saturn House. Uh, and you ask them first to experience the house without anything, like as they would, uh, as being visitors. And then they would wear the HoloLens and they would go through the experience and then they would do this mapping exercise again. And you could see the huge difference between all of the maps. In the beginning, it was mostly about the creaking sounds and the emptiness of the space and that some people thought that it felt airy. It didn't have that many furniture, actually, the house. And after the experience, uh, everyone said that it was bringing back to life. Um, uh, they were very um, um, surprised about all of the stories that they learned. And they were actually writing down uh, the stories of the people in an abstract way, so they might not be remembering the name of the soldier, but they would remember the story of the soldier of this house. Um, so uh, they were the, 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 the mapping, the meaning uh, mapping, and also the focus groups later showed that they were very much engaged uh, in this activity. Uh, and I used the theory uh, from game based learning that says that because it's really difficult to measure learning. You know, it needs a lot of uh, longitudinal studies most of the time. That when people are engaged in an activity, they learn. Um, and it, it, this came out very much in, uh, in the focus group as well, that what people were actually, you know, either referring to names or uh, remembering the stories. Um, so this led me to understand that this kind of this, uh, uh, is a way for them at least to uh, not learn the story, because that the learning the story was not important, but just remembering that in Saturn House, at some point there was a men's institute and there was a lot of, of the men who went and 
to the First World War and some of them died as well, it, it's just enough information. So learning is not, for me, is not about, uh, you know, learning uh, a date, but about um, uh, create, like um, understanding the, the, the story of, of the space and, and make meaning of it. Um, there were different uh, discussions about the technology and how close or how away you would be from certain objects and how you interact with them. Some people would sit and, and watch something for a long time. Some others would like uh, want to go to the next one. Uh, some people would like to sit still. Some others would go around whatever was happening. And I'll show you a very short video shortly after. Uh, so the movement, to go back to the body, the movement of the people were, was very interesting. And that's my, I guess the people who are coming from performance will probably laugh at this uh, notation that was from the, the annotation of the visitor's journey. So we had specific points, that's a top view of the, of the room, and the reds were specific, specific points where we would kind of allow some playful interaction um, if people wanted it. So we never had any prescriptive things. We had things that would be like there if people wanted to play with it. For example, the middle point that you're gonna see on the video as well, uh, was a, a dance of uh, a minuet, a, two shoe, a pair of shoes dancing a minuet. That was the, um, uh, at the school, the girls' school part. And, and some people would, say, like most of the people would sit and watch the shoes or go around them. And a few people would try to actually imitate them and learn to dance. So this kind of like playful interactions was very um, uh, interested. Uh, and from, um, from this whole process about uh, understanding uh, the role of the, of the viewer that has the HoloLens, their navigation and, and choreographing the space, their journey, um, what exactly the interactions would be, the importance of sound and all that. This made me think that what I was actually doing, or we were doing in a co-design way, was a very a similar to doing dramaturgy. So when you go into space with these mixed reality devices, you have many opportunities to design them from different perspectives. So it could be an engineering approach, it could be a strictly heritage approach, we just want to recreate a label and you know, put on the glass and you see a label coming out of the base, or you could create uh, a performance in that space. And I think that's what I tried to do. Um, it was not like a theatrical performance or a full performance, but it was the beginning of it. Uh, again, not gonna go uh, very much into this, but after, uh, after I did this and I put a lot of um, uh, thought on what we have been creating and, uh, uh, and the challenges in the process, I created a design framework for future designers uh, on the things that they have to, um, uh, to pay attention to. I'm gonna show very quickly the video because I know it's a little bit strange to talk without, um, without. Uh, time, time Maritza, time. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna show the video and I'm gonna finish. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. I mean, um, 
Fabulous. And uh, uh, to, to remain within our dialectical patterns, may I ask Maria Castrinu to step forward and perhaps uh, take us into a slightly different path, but still raising questions about this trauma, traumatizing maybe, yeah? Thank you for that comment, Thomas. Um, the designing of experience, yeah? Very, very fascinating question. With, in your case, Maritza, not everyone perhaps caught you with the technical term, the HoloLens, yeah? The device you wear on your glasses where you can see the space, but also the holograms. So <laughs> thank you so much, Maritza. Brilliant. We'll come back to discussion right after Maria Castrino. Maria? Hello. Uh, thank, thank you, Johan, for, for inviting me. Uh, and, and thank you, everyone, for the very interesting presentations. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, try to share screen. Bear with me for a bit. Uh, I prepared a, a very small presentation. Um, but, but generally, I'm, I'm very unprepared uh, <laughs> for this, as, as per um, Johan's instructions. Um, so, hello everybody, I'm a social anthropologist, I'm a political anthropologist. My main work uh, um, is about Syria, sect, statelessness and minority and religion. Um, I don't have much to do with dance, unfortunately, apart from the fact that for my initial PhD research and, and book on Syria, um, I looked at, at sect and state and power through the politics of marriage and dance and the body politic um, and, and, and how that diverged between um, the, the terrains of the, of the communal, of the personal, of the political, of the state. Um, but but um, yeah, it's been, it's been a few years. So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk today about, and it's a very, very open conversation and hopefully um, you will, um, I, I, I use this space as a, as a workshop it's <laughs> for, 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 for my project idea. Um, and hopefully I will get uh, um, some insight and, and, and ideas about how to move on from, from all of you um, wonderful and, and, and creative people. Um, so, so how did I come, a few words about me and then I'll go to the, to the specific of the project. So how did I come to, to Galton Road? This is a kind of project that emerged in my mind the past couple of years while I've been teaching a rather heavy module, uh, second year theory module on the um, classical anthropological theory. Uh, and I had um, a lecture on evolutionism. Uh, and in this lecture, I, I discovered about someone called Sir Francis Galton, who we will meet. In, in, in the presentation. And since, since I discovered, I've been playing with this idea with my students and with Johans of doing something um, with, with the Galtons. It kind of sounds like doing something with the Daltons from the <laughs> So sorry. <laughs> uh, so 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 here um, he, here it's my uh, my thoughts uh, and thanks Johans for Johan for for um, pushing me to to do something completely out of my um, comfort zone and and uh, waters of of comfort. Um, so what what will happen now? Um, I, I've, I've um, uh, divided this interjection into three acts, uh, walking, discovering and reclaiming. So there's a street where I live in Bearwood on the fringes of Birmingham and the Black Country. It's called the Galton Road. It has Victorian terraced houses. I, in fact, once went there to check out the house. If you went through the Upper St. Mary's Road and turned onto Barclay Road, then you arrived to Worley Woods. The Worley Woods is the People's Park. 
it's indeed, in fact, one of the first uh, urban parks in the UK. Uh, it was acquired as, an, as a community trust based urban park in 1906. Uh, now, interestingly, this, the Galtons and, and the Worley Woods Park, which is a beautiful, um, huge park and, um, um, and, and a golf course, um, has a very interesting uh, history. I mean, it's, 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 it's very leafy, it's a, it's a place of attraction for for us, uh, for uh, dog walkers and, and uh, people with uh, children and parents alike um, and runners and so on. Um, the, the, the beautiful park was acquired as the private parkland of Samuel Galton um, in the 1790s. Um, and during that time, he asked two very famous um, one architect and uh, one uh, landscape designer to to design the land and the the house um, and, and his house in in uh, um, 1819 the the abbey the Worley Abbey uh, was built it has no the, the only the, the religious connotations is is just in the name. It is uh, it is a house for the Galton ham family, um, which was very very uh, big and, and illustrious. Um, the the house fell into disrepair um, around 1902, so in the beginning of the 20th century, where the Birmingham City Council acquired it, and then it was kind of saved by. Um, as, as a public space in 1906, um, and it, it became then the, 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 the space for, um, for, for, for um, yeah, the, what it is today, basically. Um, so when you walk in, in the park, this is one part of the, of the history. Um, I hope you can, you can kind of see it. Uh, it details the history of the place. It has a photo of, of uh, the Abbey House, which, which was demolished in 1957 and had fell into so much disrepair. Uh, but before it firstly housed the, the, the family of the, of the Galton, um, and at one point, even some um, in, the, in World War I, some um, Belgian um, refugees. Um, so this, the, the, the actual house doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's, it, it, was, it was brought down in 1957. Um, there's very, apart from this placard, there's very little evidence of, of its existence, of course, and, and the name of the, of the Worley Woods and the Abbey Road and so on um, are, are reminders of, of the existence of, of this road. Um, but uh, yeah, there's very little uh, kind of um, commemoration. Um, and this is really, really quite interesting and, and somehow um, contemporary. Um, because because the Galton family was was a very um, significant history in uh, family in terms of local history. So Samuel John Galton was a Quaker and an arms manufacturer, uh, very much involved in the slave trade. Um, he was also an illustrious member of the Lunar Society. Um, and, and he kind of, you know, he combined, uh, I guess, both his, his uh, connection to the slave trade um, with uh, uh, his more peaceful, <laughs> in quotations, um, part of, of, of being a Quaker. Quaker. It's also interesting um, that his, his factories were, were part of the Black Country in Birmingham, where the Industrial Revolution uh, took place in, um, in, in uh, uh, Britain. Um, and it took place on, on, on very much on the backs of the working classes um, here um, um, 
it was it, it became known as the black country because of the coal because of the pollution uh, that, the, that, that the people lived in, um, and specifically this part of, of England, um, apart from the arms manufacture, was also uh, making, um, it is, was also very famous for steelworks and was making um, steelworks for collars and chains, particularly, specifically for the slave trade. Um, and, and an interesting historical fact I, I found was that a lot of the a lot of the uh, nitty gritty of the um, steel making of the collars were actually outsourced to really really poor um, women uh, on the fringes of of around this area that used to live uh, usually in single house um, households so very poor. Uh, kind of uh, women um, and a local historian has uncovered um, uh, an instance where these women uh, had a strike um, in, in making these, these collars and chains because they kind of realized that, that their condition um, was almost um, uh, was not dissimilar to, to the um, ensla enslaved and unfree labor, uh, that what they were making uh, helped, uh, helped create and, 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 co and, 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 uh, um, and maintain. Maria, time. Okay. Okay. So, 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 um, and, and of course, the, the, uh, the very big uh, Sir. Francis Galton uh, was a, a truly Victorian polymath uh, um, who in his illustrious career was also the founder of eugenics. Um, very often we associate eugenics with, with Nazi Germany, but actually, and very interestingly, and for very, very good reason, it has its own um, uh, history and birth in, in, in industrialism and in the development of, of capitalism. So Sir Francis, Walter, uh, Francis, Sir Francis Galton um, was uh, famous for, for uh, discovering the, the word eugenics. Um, he, he argued uh, very much for the hereditary genius uh, so that that whoever is basically great and important now, it is not because of um, socioeconomic factors or or lack. It's because there is a kind of of gene, um, and so society is kind of stratified, uh, you know, from from the undesirables who deserve their situation to. The, the 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 leaders of society with very little space of course for for women for other um, people uh for for the working classes um for um, uh, yes for, for for anybody but whoever was you know in 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 power and i think this is really interesting because when you go back to the kind of Victorian um, eugenics movement and the kind of social evolutionism, social um, Darwinism, then we, we rediscover a really interesting link between what we've been talking about disability, uh, disability as being something inherited, um, something um, uh, uh, not good and all the other vi vices of society such as uh, vices of society such as mental health womanhood uh, being black all of a, all of a different race um, and being working class so all of these are kind of historically lumped together and thought about together and this is really interesting because it's really important i think to historicize the connection between otherness and capitalist development and productivity and the need for a productive normative good worker that 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 you know comes up um in in the uh, in the throes um and of course, his his connection with Spencer is, is is very well known, but I would not go on that because Johan doesn't want me to. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's the, we're running out of time, Maria. Yeah, That's the yeah. issue. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. So, so here, 
Um, I'm, I'm quoting from uh, uh, Jay Gould's book, The Mismeasurement of Man. Um, Galton, sir, uh, I should stop calling him sir. Um, uh, I, I do it ironically. He was obsessed with measuring everything from the weather to human people. Um, so he, he, he was very much responsible for, the, the, for, for developing scientific, scientific psychological tests, developing fingerprints, developing anthropometric um, machines to, to, to measure your ability, your capability. Um, and and the policing of that. So we have the kind of the hereditary and the policing, the institution, institutionalization um, of of these measurements for the control of the population. Um, reclaiming space. Uh, this is for you. Um, how can we reclaim space? Um, how can we learn about the history that so so that is so somehow normalized in 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 very objective looking um and neutral uh, placards as as the placard that i showed you in um, um in in the park um how can we how can we resist how can we make interventions in these kind of spaces uh, whether they are artistic or activist or pedagogical um even um and and on that note uh, i think there's a, a, a there is an interesting there's some interesting stories about uh, um uh, ghosts in in the worldly woods being being hunted um especially a kind of uh, uh gray lady who is um variously associated with either unhappy women of the galton or um, women whose whose lover were lost, or even um, a Chinese uh, horrific murder that happened in the in the uh, um, park. So, uh, is is there a kind of is could we allow the the kind of apparitions, the kind of ghosts, the local histories of ghosts? to in a way open the spaces of questioning the history of questioning the uncertainties that that exists in the way that historiography is written um, in placards and neatly arranged in urban uh, spaces and, and and parks would that be an authentic way to go through it I don't know, um, but um, to, to close, Johan, is it okay to to share the the, the video that you put you together, um, or, or not all of it, just 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 a moment um, of it um, after after our conversations and and. Um... Uh, so if you go out of your share, um, I. I, I want to share one bit that I have chosen. Oh, okay. Then you go ahead. But you you remember you know we are out of time now, uh, so we need to break for dinner in three minutes. Go ahead. Are you are you can you still see? Well, it, the film is too long. Um, uh, not not all. I'm I'm, I'm going to stop it. I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. Call. Go ahead. I'm I'm shy about the film, sorry. I approach a field. A black piano waits at its center. I 
fingers sliding the slimy gums, slick lips, snout. Not a piano, but a mare, draped in a black sheet, white mouth sticking out like a fist. I kneel at my beast. The sheet sunken at her ribs. A dented piano where rain collected from the night reflects a blue sky fallen into the side of a horse. Blue thumbprint pressed from above as if something needed to be snuffed this black blossom dropped on the field where I am only a visitor. I am standing on the corner of Almeda and Southmore, the 5200 block of Almeda. And I... Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Maritza. And uh, before we break for dinner, um, Hmm, Maria, well, I'm honored, of course, that you would want to show this finger exercise. It was meant to evoke Wally, uh, Wood, Wally, Woods, Wally Woods, and I'm moving into sort of a, with my voice, into a remembrance of the professor of eugenics. But that's really uh, Maria's street, and I, uh, I don't know enough about that history. Do we have a urgent resp quick response? Because obviously we can go to 6.30 before we break. Anyone who would like to comment on this dramatization of history and Maria, uh, the haunting, the haunted ghosts in the woods, yeah? Uh, the local history of ghosts that is so powerful. Cool. Any comments? Thank you. And, and maybe Petra tonight, when you present, we can return to the ghosts. Yeah, we will. And in a way- We will uh, return to many things. Yeah, we, we have had such an intense afternoon. Maybe we're just at the moment a bit breathless. And I wanna then suggest we take for refreshments. My guests have to walk over to a, a small place. So uh, I think we said we reopen around, um, well, uh, about 15, 20 minutes after seven local time. So let's, let's take a, a, a decent break. Thank you all, yeah? And then see you at around um, 9, 15, 9, uh, 19, uh, 7, 15, 7, yeah. Shall we seven. say 7.20, I mean? 7.20, 7. <laughs> 20, seven to 20. know when we come back, okay. 7.20. Petra will mm -hmm. take us on a trip. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a Thanks beautiful everybody. break. Thank you.